deep in an underground secret Pacific Island lair, Pop Culture Minefield presents Saturday Morning Fun Time. This is the Comic Relief Crusader telling you to get your morning cereal ready because here we go! Hey guys, uh, it is a very special Saturday morning fun time here on a weekday because it's Halloween season. And uh, we've got the regular uh, troop here. We got Martina Costa Santana. We got uh, my partner in crime. Keith Moncrief, and of course, for some reason, the woman that loves me is also here, but also we have a very special guest who is here today, which is why we're doing the show tonight. Uh, it is uh, my friend, uh, Frank La Loja. Now, this is not a regular Loja. He's a La Loja. Echo, you got that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's a I lot of Loja. That, like, ten times in the last couple How days. many Lojas are you? A lot of Loja. A lot um, of love, yeah. And you get the double G, too, unlike, uh, 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 I just got his name, uh, the great actor. Robert. Well, you know, Robert. When, I, when I was in grammar school, Robert. they assembled Robert everybody. They assembled everybody in the auditorium. I was in the sixth grade. So I'm sitting there with kids from sixth grade on down. We're all sitting there. And the principal gets up on the stage and he says, ladies and gentlemen, students, one and all, he says, today we're here to honor the boy of the year. It's our very first boy of the year award. And the boy of the year is a person who not only does well academically, but is kind and is liked by all his fellow students and teachers. And this year, the boy of the year is Frank Lalaga. <laughs> and I'm, sitting wow. there, I'm, sitting, I'm sitting there next to my classmates and I go, that lucky son of a bitch, who is he? Frank Lalaga. Who the hell Frank is Lalaga? <laughs> I don't think, you know, yeah, sincerely. Frank, that's you. <laughs> the sweet little girl, my sweet little grass, classmate next to me. So I got a little trophy, you know, a cup about that tall on a wooden base. And it sat in uh it sat in my bedroom on my bureau as I was, uh, I think it was there until I actually left, left home, maybe. And ironically, I was going through some old photos uh, of the family. And what do I see in the background, you know, in one of the photos is that tiny little trophy, Boy of the Year. Then a, a number of years later, I went back to my old grammar school, you know. Yeah, and sure enough, they put up a plaque. Not only did I get the trophy, but the, they put up a plaque in the hall of all the Boy of the Year Award winners. And there I was, Frank Laloga, the first Boy of the Year. There. So my name's been bastardized oh. in so many ways. That That's only one of them. It's well, what you Americans notice do. On my, well, well, you, you look at my name correctly. You and you notice I, I spelled it G-A-R-R-Y. That's because I've hit a point of frustration with so many people calling me Jerry. I decided to put an A there so they'll stop doing it. Yeah, well, we went through that last You time and I actually. did. <laughs> As, but, I, hey, I wanted to point out, you know, you saw it already. But when, when I watched your movie, uh, it had such an impact on me because it reminded me of my brother Michael and me. Hmm. Uh, because we had a very deep relationship until his death. And, uh, and what he died of, I didn't tell you, is that he got cancer from hepatitis C. And he thought he called me to tell me he was going to die, and I'm like, that ain't happening. So my sister and I, we got him into the cancer treatment center down in Phoenix and got him into the VA program. And they, the doctor said, we got this. We got it soon enough. We're going to save your brother. And we just thought, that's it. We, we succeeded. We did what we set out to do, and he was dead within 10 days. Because he started hemorrhaging. And instead of bothering someone, because my brother didn't want to bother anyone, he laid there and threw up blood for a day until he had thrown up enough blood that his organs started shutting down. And he died from that. Uh, being polite can get you killed. And I tell people that. Oh, Speak oh absolutely. Speak you got to fight like hell when you wind up in any hospital. Yeah, and, so and you've always got to question 
you know, very you yeah doing. exactly you never you never, you never you've got to that. speak up for yourself there, there's there's no such thing as somebody advocating for you you have absolutely. to advocate for yourself absolutely uh, but here is my brother michael and me in 1969 oh, and God. that is why if you look at that i look a lot like uh lucas haas yeah, in that movie you, have, you do you you and actually even my dad pointed out, he goes, that kid looks like you when you were a little. I know it's weird. So I really identify with your film because it really triggered so many emotions wow, and feelings nice. and memories of childhood. And I really love that movie for that reason. It just stays with me. And when F Facebook has done so many wonderful things for me, it allows me to keep up with my family. Uh, but it, it introduced me to you. There you go. I'm like, is that really Frank Lelosia? Get the fuck out of here. And we became yeah. friends and we talked. And I just think you're wonderful. I love and I've been trying out. to get rid of you ever since. I know. And it doesn't work. One day. <laughs> it'll happen one day. You can't fuck um, me. Nah. It doesn't work. Period. I love you. stuck with Gary. You're stuck I love with you, Gary. Gary. I love you, I love Jerry. you too, Frank. Gary. You're so Gary. awesome. I love uh, and I loved when you were on the last time because you found a girl that was a fan of your film that was young. And she's still friends with me on my Twitter account. That's and um, I just thought, this is one of the most fun things I'll probably ever get to do. We got to prank her. <laughs> that she had no idea she was going to get to meet you on the show. Well, I'd seen she, I saw her, uh, I saw it. I saw it. I saw her post, uh, post she made on Twitter. And she said, so, I love this film, Lady in White. She said, somebody, please, if you have a podcast, invite me on because I, I want to be able to discuss this film. And I have so many feelings about this film and I need to I need to get on somebody's podcast. So when Gary asked me <laughs> if I would do the podcast, I said, we'll do it on one condition. I said, I want you to get in touch with this woman. And I don't want you to ask her to join the podcast because you intend to talk about the film, but don't tell her I'm going to be there. So we surprised her, you know, I showed up and, uh, and it was a lovely time, wasn't it? So we yes, made, her, we made, we made her wish a minor wish come, come true. And that was lovely. Very much so. And in fact, I've got the video here. Um, I'll go ahead and play it. Oh, real quick. Wow. Uh, I'm trying to get it to load up right now because how come all we're getting is is these icons? Why aren't these people showing up? Where's Anima? She's so lovely, you know. Where's Martin? It's a good question. Where's Keith? Come on, you guys. Martinez decided not to be a real person. Oh, yeah, Martin, jump on. on <laughs> be a real person. No. Anima, jump on. No. Yeah, it's what I compare this to is Mark Hamill doing Empire Strikes Back when he's on the set. He's the only person. Everything else is Muppets. Yeah, we're a panel of Muppets. There we go. We got panel Keith. Muppets. Mm. Come on, Anima. You're so but lovely. My problem is I sometimes buffer when I do this. Yeah, so. he has a sneaking mm. problem. That's why he does it. But Look, here we go. I'm going to go ahead and show this. Habits. I don't want to hear about your sexual habits. Just <laughs> sexual <laughs> 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 All right, Frank, up? here's the video of that young lady. I'm going to go ahead and hit play. I'm watching Autumn right now to see if she figures out who that is. Uh, <laughs> Hello. What's going on? Oh. <laughs> oh. Autumn. Hello. Do you know who Autumn. that is? I've been uh, so wanting to meet you. <laughs> I haven't looked at that. That's Frank. Now I'm going to say that. I, I just love that video. I really do. I I remember seeing that show. Yeah. She was genuinely surprised. Too. She was. She was like, oh, yeah. That was fun. That was fun. <laughs> but Anima, are you not going to get on camera with Frank? There you go. You as much as I do. Oh, I'm so proud uh. of you. Thank you. Now, Martin, you have 10 seconds to show up or I'm leaving. And I'm serious. <laughs> Uh, Get on under the camera. That. I'm sorry. Nope. Yeah, there you nope. go, guys. That's the proof yeah. of the other hostage. Nope. <laughs> One. No. Come on. You're Martin, such a don't head. cost us the Three, show. Three, four, five, six, seven, <laughs> eight, <laughs> nine. Are you coming? 
Martina Costa Santana. Hey. Oh, I, I wanted this. Look at all those beautiful faces. Now I'm good. Now you I'm got it. I'm, I'm leaving. Now okay, I will tell you, it. Frank, I don't no, know if no, I mentioned it. <laughs> <laughs> the only Italian I knew as a kid was from this one nun because I went to Catholic school for a year. And she would whack the shit out of me all the time on the back of the head or the back of my, she'd hit me with a, a chalk stick on the back of my hand to get my attention. And she would say it. And I think, I, I don't know, I know I'm not saying it correctly, but it's, it's, Testadora escuch. Testadora escuch. Testadura. Which I was told meant listen up, knucklehead or bonehead. Yeah, something like that. Well, testadura is hardhead. Yeah. Hardhead. Hardhead. And, well, and I, then, I didn't get what else she said. Testadura. It was like escuch. And I don't I remember. I was a child, but it was yeah. it was supposed yeah, to mean yeah. listen up, listen up, uh, knucklehead or you know bonehead, hardhead. <laughs> and um but that the thing that was funny is they would also whack me sometimes when i was being sincere because they thought i was being sarcastic because i'm emphatic i emphasize and so they thought i was being sarcastic and they'd hit me and i'm like i'm being sincere <laughs> you're sincerely <not> sarcastic <laughs> that's what you get for being a dick gary i know well, it's i don't think you're emphatic i've seen plenty of other people more emphatic than you there's well, you're, you live in Italy, I'm sure. He's like, he's, like, he's <laughs> enormous. He's that emphatic. That uh, Italy created speaking with your hands. Ah, uh, yes. <laughs> I thought I did. How do you like you that? You did. Hey. <laughs> so you grew up in upstate New York. Yeah. Uh, were you from upstate New York or, or were you transplanted? Uh, well, I grew up in upstate New York, uh, ethnically speaking. My father was born in Italy. My mother was Sicilian, but born in the States. Yeah, you're a first-generation American. Yeah. 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 Which is why I told Anima, I think that's why you really wanted to move to Italy, because you still felt that connection. Well, I wanted to move to Italy, yes, because I, I, I came here for the first time in 1986, right at the cusp of getting Lady in White made. And uh, we were putting together the financial entity to make the film, going public at the time. Right. And I um, and I fell in love with this place, and uh, I was only here for a week. And uh, but uh, when I came back, the, the the next time I came back was in 1988, while Lady was still uh, basically uh, 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 being released throughout the world. It had already been released in the states, and it was it was platforming through the rest of the world. And I came here to write a screenplay called The Giant which is the story of Michelangelo's creation of the David when he was 26 to 29. I spent six weeks here in Tuscany writing. And, um, and then I brought a small crew back about three months later, including Russ Carpenter, who shot Lady. We storyboarded, we budgeted, and I tried for many years to get that picture up. In the course of making those two trips, I fell even more in love. And I also made a number of close friends. And so for years, I thought, well, one day I'm going to buy a place in Italy and I can I can uh, I can live both in Los Angeles and continue to uh, pursue uh, my film ventures and live in Italy as well. But then finally, in uh, 2001, I decided this is it. I'm done with Los Angeles. I don't want to deal with this shit anymore. So I sold everything, my house, everything I had, basically. I moved out here. Actually, it was 2005 because I took a little detour for a few years and then uh, moved here in 2005. So I've been here since 2005 and it was great, great move. Uh, one of the best decisions I've ever made. Love it. And I was curious, you know, were there other reasons why um, you chose to move to Italy and just become, you know, Italian? Well, my, my roots, as you mentioned earlier, had a lot to do with it so i wanted to explore them further but could you show that in the film the italian being spoken around the house yes 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 but I, I i the truth of the matter is if i if i as i said i developed a real passion for uh particularly for tuscany and uh, considering my roots i already had a passion for the culture and i wanted to live it i wanted to come here and live it but the other reason was if i didn't get out of la at that time I wouldn't be here today because 
I've been so beaten up uh, by uh, that business that I, I just, I had to make a break and a total break. Otherwise, uh, I wasn't going to make it. So, so uh, and it, it was uh, wonderful that I had another passion, you know, to turn to. And that was uh, Italy coming here. And a lot of that was bred uh, by virtue of my background, but also a lot of it was bred by virtue of coming here to write The Giant. The, the Giant never happened. I pursued it for years and years and years. Too bad, because it would have been a spectacular film. But I uh, liked your last short film. It was very good. Yeah, but if I hadn't come here uh, to write The Giant, I might not have moved here. So it's it's uh, really it's, it it turned out to be serendipitous nonetheless because uh, so the project even though the project never happened it was really the main uh, the main instigator in uh, in nurturing my love for well I have a question because you know you have a domestic partner I don't want to say his name if you don't want him to oh, he's my husband the husband yeah. and the question is did you meet there or meet here and transplant him there. No, we met here. Uh, okay, so it wasn't a big shakeup for him. No, no, we met okay. here. He was here for six months. Uh, he was here for. I had been here for six months, and the last thing I was looking for was uh, was uh, you know <laughs> a, a, a partner. I'd had a couple of them in the past, long term relationships, more than a couple. Yeah. But it just so happened, and uh, we've been together since two thousand two thousand and six. And then we uh, we had a civil uh, civil union performed in 2018, so we're married. There Italian in Italy, Italy. we're married. And, Italian, so, yeah. and not to so mention that's the, that's the question of... I have is, as a Catholic country, because uh, somebody asked me that, and I, I'm asking you because they asked me. It's like, the, how is the gay community treated there? Well, you know, uh, they passed uh, a law allowing for civil unions about 2016. And right. it was a hard fought battle. So when did gay marriage happen in the US? Shortly prior, I think, just prior. Yeah, it's within different. the last 10 years, it yeah. really So in any out. case, uh, but they made it a condition of the law that uh, gay couples could not adopt children. <clears throat> and, and, uh, and that's how they managed to finally get the damn law through. Now, the-, uh, the It's one step at a time. Yeah, gay rights activists. So that was to appease the church, ultimately, right. like to do enough of a degree, you know, to be able to get the thing passed. Gay gay rights activists and also people who are just generally on the left and, and were open to this idea, you know, so no problem with it, uh, ultimately decided, okay, if that's what we've got to do to get a, a, a civil union in place, that's fine, we'll do it. Now, sadly, what's happened recently is about a year and a half ago, uh, a right-wing government was elected. That hadn't happened for quite a while since Berlusconi, led by a woman by the name of uh, Georgia Maloney, and uh, who has fascist roots. Uh, she was with the party uh, that was actually a fascist party when she began as a teenager, uh, her political climb. In any case, she's taken the government uh, right at, at this point. And recently they've decided that gay couples who have civil unions and or are, have been together and uh, in the States would be considered to be, uh, what's, the, what's the term they use, have a common law marriage for many years, right? They've decided and they've passed a law in this regard that only one, if they've had children, you know, if they're surrogate children, only the a genetically linked parent can be the legal parent of the child. That's overly scrutinized. It's, it's, it's maddening. Yeah. Really yeah. maddening. And, and when, when this government was elected, when she was elected, she played it down the middle, but, you know, anybody who had any sense, it just... Uh, delved into her. Yeah, because uh, as most people know, I'm I'm politically conservative, but I'm socially liberal. Yeah. Uh, so I'm a huge advocate for gay rights. My son, you know, my son is gay, and um, um, and I've always said I think 
my happiness comes from my gay friends because they've made my life so awesome <laughs> over yeah. the years. And I'm going to tell you this too. Nobody can throw a party like a gay man. <laughs> no one. I've been to a lot of gay parties. And, and Terry Mundy, who's my uh, my oldest gay friend, we've been friends since childhood. He, uh, you know, I said, what's your secret? How do you throw these awesome party gifts? Never invite a lesbian. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my. <laughs> and I said, why? And he says, they hate men. So never invite them. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, well, to each his own. <laughs> to each his own. But anyway, I'm so glad you're here again, Frank. Um, I want to get into this. We're going to get the slideshow going here for some of these photos. And then we'll get into the slideshow for the movie. Uh, and what I hope for with doing the slideshow for the movie is that we get a chance for, as you're looking at it, something will pop into your mind. Right. But here we go. This is the, some of the stuff he sent, this article. Right. Can you now, tell us I about this? It may be difficult to see here. But this is a print uh, print article that appeared in uh, the Chicago, let's see, Roger Ebert was the Chicago Sun-Times, right? Yes. So the other paper that Siskel had his print column in, of Siskel and Ebert fans. He was with the Tribune, as I recall. Was the Chicago Tribune. Yep. All right. Now, so this is uh, Siskel's Chicago Tribune column. Uh, and his review of Lady in White. It's not important that you uh, you get to see the print in this regard. But the reason I sent this along, yeah, there's an interesting story behind this. Recently, I put together a website uh, where I put up all of my personal, many, many personal clippings and articles from my scrapbook. It's franklaloja.com. So anybody who uh, is interested in uh, taking a look, who loves the film, should go there because there's a lot of wonderful stuff there. And in the course of going through boxes and boxes and boxes of material, I come up with this, this article that I had never, had never really connected with me and Siskel's review in the uh, Chicago Tribune. Now, on their television show, Siskel and Ebert, it was quite a, actually quite an exciting show. When they reviewed Lady in White, uh, uh, Roger Ebert gave it a very enthusiastic thumbs up, and Gene Siskel gave it a thumbs down. Now, I want to proceed this with another little kind of sidestep. After they'd screened the picture, and I was aware of the fact that they had seen the picture and that they would be reviewing it on their show, a very dear friend of mine who also worked on the film and was working for me at our offices in Los Angeles, uh, Chris Nielsen, happened to go to a Hollywood event and he spotted them at this Hollywood event. So he was with a crowd of people outdoors as Siskel and Ebert were entering and he yelled out to them, what did you think about Lady in White? And Chris came back and told me that they both turned around and gave a thumbs up like this. So I thought, oh, that's wonderful because I didn't know what they were going to say, whether or not they liked the film at that point. Anyway, the show happens and it turns out that Siskel uh, gives it a thumbs down and they fight over the film quite, quite uh, heavily. And Ebert gives it a major thumbs up. So for all these years and many others, I think, might have seen that show, that clip. I thought, OK, so he didn't like it. He's an asshole. He's a jerk. But he didn't like it. The guy whose opinion mattered to me most anyway was Ebert. And then I come across this, his print article. Siskel's print article in the Chicago Tribune. And again, you may not be able to see the print, but under his uh, capsule review of Lady in White, what does he give it? It's right down here at the bottom, a thumbs up. Now, how did that happen? Right? I, my theory is, if you go look at the show, and it is, an, I put it on my uh, on, on the website, so it's on the website, uh, the review of the film. Uh, of their show, of Lady and White, their show. I I have a feeling that perhaps uh, Ebert may have misled him to think that he wasn't he didn't particularly care for the film either, and then did a total turnaround because oh. this film seems as though you know he's shocked by Ebert's reaction. And by the time that happened, Siskel had already submitted 
shenanigans. This was so I can't prove that. But the interesting thing about this, at least for me anyway, is that all these years after mm -hmm. having seen that show and thinking that Cisco gave it a thumbs down, you know, in fact, he had given the, the film a thumbs up as well in his Chicago Reader column. So that's why I sent that along because I thought it would be an interesting anecdote. That is interesting. Um, I was friends with uh, Roger Ebert. I, I Yeah, I remember you telling me. I took over because uh, uh, one of the magazines he actually had written for, I was one of the new critics. And um, uh, so we would meet for lunch and stuff. I, I liked him a lot. We'd argue. Uh, but um, when you're critics, you argue. <laughs> it's just a simple fact. I was more of a fan of Ebert than I was of Siskel anyway. So, but yeah, that sounds like shenanigans. <laughs> he was yeah, so later, doing that. Well, this article is on the website as well. Anybody who wants to take a look at it, all they have to do is search. James exactly. Google, and here know. is the website for those who want to go. It's franklalogia.com. Uh, do you want to go ahead and share that, Martin, in the uh, chat? Yeah. Or did you already? Uh, I already oh, you it. did. You did. I see it already, there. Already out. Yep. It's already out there. Yeah. There are hundreds of, uh, I scanned, I spent uh, almost two months scanning all this material. There's a lot of media on the site as well, meaning visual media. So uh, there are hundreds. I think there, there are about 500, 600 print articles that appeared throughout the world related to the film. So uh, it's the kind of site that <laughs> there's so much there that I think you can go in and spend a little while there and go back and always discover something new and interesting about the production, what people thought about the film. Around that. Yeah, exactly. And, and you and Anima are that. in the same time zone, by the way. I think that's interesting because ah. uh, you're you both of you are seven hours uh, ahead of us. It's uh, what ten forty two in in the evening there. So we appreciate you staying up late with us. No problem. <laughs> no problem. For you, you ever you, plan to come Gary, back here? for you, Gary? Any? Oh man, you are so awesome. Within, within reason. Within reason. <laughs> So, um, my gosh, uh, next image, dude. Uh, look at this. This just happened today. Uh, it's a meme, obviously. And it, uh, well, it's self-evident as to what's going on here. And my dear friend, high school buddy, uh, uh, Robert uh, uh, Kuhn, okay, he's on the right. And he created this meme. He He's been a fan of the film for, for many, many years. And so he's on the right. And I just thought this was lovely and fun. And so I thought I'd share it with you. That is so cool. That is so <laughs> cool. And again, I want to point out that, you know, um, my dad watched this movie with me. It's a movie we shared. Uh, and, uh, and he said that Lucas Haas at that age looked like me as a kid. And so, and I love that. And by the way, this young man here, the older brother in it, which by the way, you flipped that in real life. You were the older brother, right? Yeah, that's true. Yeah. That's you true. flipped that in the story, but in this one, the young man that, that is in this, I love this kid. And he just disappeared one day. So it just left film. He was in a, one of my other favorite uh, coming of age stories called the explorers or right. simply explorers. Great. But that's movie. Jason. That's Jason Preston. Yeah. And he's a good young all... actor. Among all of the cast, Jason and I have remained very, very close, uh, more than uh, I have with any anybody else. As a matter I'm of curious, fact, why did he leave film? Did because he, he got it. it. Just, look, that business, you know, uh, success can be your your greatest enemy, and ultimately does become your greatest enemy in that business. Uh, Jason had just uh, had enough. You know, he he just didn't want to do it anymore. And uh, <clears throat> so he's now a registered nurse, phenomenal uh, human he's being. He's up in Oregon, uh, isn't he? No, no, he lives uh, in, uh, in Lancaster. In, uh, oh, really? In California, right. And he's got a beautiful little boy who's about uh, eight, nine years old. Called, his name is Garrett. And we're in touch all the time. We, we speak two, three times a week. So that's I love amazing. Jason, love Jason dearly. Well, if anyway, you were just, ever interested in doing a podcast with us, man, I'd love to interview him. Well, I could ask him, but he's yeah. pretty reticent uh, about. Uh, he's about very quiet. He stays off the yeah. map. Yeah, yeah, about 
doing any kind of media. You know, he likes to keep his past uh, firmly in place. And but I, if you tell him anything, tell him I was also a nurse and a combat medic and a, worked as a paramedic too. Yeah, I will. And also that photo that uh, we saw earlier, your father was absolutely right. It's, uh, it's obvious. You did. You, you and Lucas did. Yeah. Did and uh, and I just I you know and I love that because the movie really reminds me of my brother Mike and me. Yeah, of course. Okay, I love All these right. kinds of photos. So what's going on here? All right, this is this is a very special photo. Uh, and again, going through all this material, also personal files, I come up with this photo that I really uh, I didn't recall having. This is a photo of myself at, I'd say, age 15 in the family room of our home. Now, from left, that's my mother in the red blouse sitting on the sofa next to her is Mama Asunta. Now, Mama Asunta was personified in Lady in White as Mama Asunta. She was Frankie's grandmother. So that's right. the real Mama Asunta. And then to Mama Asunta's left and to uh, the viewer's right, kind of leaning against the back of the sofa, is my brother, Gene. I was about to say, that's your brother, because you're the bigger brother, the, the bigger kid there. Call them Gino. Yeah. And he was three years younger than me. And then if you veer a little bit more to viewers right on the right, that's me sitting on the floor. And next to me yeah. is my Bell and Howell projector. And next to me on my left and further to the right, guess who that is? That's Papa that's, Charlie. That's Papa Charlie, the smoker. That's, right. That's the real Papa Charlie. And, and, and I knew that that had to come from real life, the whole cigarette thing. Exactly. He's, he always had a cigarette. Between so obviously what I'm doing here is I'm I'm running something on my 16 millimeter projector for everybody to see on the wall probably uh, it's a blank wall that, that was fairly like maybe I set up a screen I don't remember so this is uh, this is uh, to me a very very special photo what makes it uh, particularly interesting I would think for the fans is that you've got the real Mama Asunta and Papa Charlie sitting there those that that's, inspired that's the characters the thing about in the film. Lady. that aspect of the film was highly autobiographical very much so and you can tell you can tell because everything just felt so real in that <laughs> film and that whole bit with the cigarette with uh you know him having hiding to, smoking that that happened and and we turned <laughs> him in regularly so <laughs> you I, guys I, knocked on we, him we, we, we would shout him out and he'd get so frustrated <laughs> we had so much fun as kids but it was you know <laughs> It was cruel of us to do so. And the rapport between them was very much as portrayed in the film. But they, they loved each other dearly, as you can tell in the film. But Alana, this is uh, this is an interesting uh, throwback in time. I'll, I went to Los Angeles when I was 20 years old. So I'd never been there before. Myself and my girlfriend, Susan, drove across country. And I took an apartment not far from Westlake, you know, in Los Angeles. And uh, I knew no one, uh, basically. So I decided since I'd had uh, uh, plenty of uh, amateur acting experience, college theater, high school theater, I was only 20 years old at the time, that uh, what I needed to do, I wanted to make movies. But what I, I'd made short films as a kid. But I thought, okay, professionally speaking, Maybe I can get some work as an actor. And so uh, I managed to find myself an agent. And, uh, and I went in and I read for, among other things, a film called Fun with Dick and Jane, starring Jane Fonda. And here, as in this photo, George Siegel. And it was directed by a director by the name of Ted Kotcheff, wonderful Canadian director, who had directed the apprenticeship of Dudley Kravitz, which was the film that launched Richard Dreyfuss, which I'd seen. So I went in to read for a co-starring role in that film, and I got it to uh, play opposite George Siegel in a, a really nice featured role. And uh, so we were in the process of uh, getting the deal together. It was amazing because it was maybe like the second or third audition that I'd even ventured to go on. Well, uh, after getting to LA, arriving in LA. And we were about to sign the contracts 
And then uh, I got a call and uh, my agent told me, I'm sorry, Frank, uh, the producer said he wants somebody older to play off of Siegel. And Kotcheff, the director, fought for me, but he didn't win the battle. So I didn't get the role. So the picture went into production. And uh, while it's in the course of production, one day I get a call from my agent. And he says, Frank, Ted Kotcheff called me and he said, I feel so badly about what happened to Frank. Why don't you ask him if he wants to come in and work a day on the film at, here at Warner's? We're shooting at Warner's tomorrow or the next day. So I said, sure. So I went in. So I wound up as an, uh, an extra with a, with a line. Uh, and I, I had a couple of lines, basically. I was at the telephone company while they robbed uh, uh, Siegel and Jane Fonda. Their characters robbed the phone company. And, uh, and this shot was one of the uh, production stills that was taken that day on the shoot. And the funny thing about it is that uh, my hometown paper, I grew up in Rochester, New York, got wind of the fact that I was in the picture. And my old theater manager, actually, he was the one who made them aware of it. I worked as an usher at the Lowe's Theater from when, when I was age 14. I lied about my age to work as an usher because I wanted to be there as close to I, uh, projected movies as I could watch them, study them. And uh, so Frank Lindcap, the manager, went to the papers and said, our ex usher, you know, Frankie, he's in he's in fun with Dick and Jane. So the newspapers jumped on board and they 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 printed up an article about how, you know, I was making it big in Hollywood. <laughs> That's like <laughs> two lines. And if you blinked, you, you, you'd never catch me or see me in the scene. But I, as I, once again, going through all of this material for the website, I thought it would be fun to send this along and discuss that that event. Well, I'm I'm a big fan of that film. I hated the remake. I love yeah. the original. Um, now, what is this? This is uh, my dear, dear Elizabeth Hoffman, uh, who played uh, one of the leads, uh, and she was actually as far as the performances go, the, the grounding force among the actors in Fear No Evil, which was my first feature film. And the reason why I wanted to share this today is because I found out two days ago that Liz had died. No, no. no. she lived to 97. Oh my God, that's a great life right there. When she did Fear No Evil, she was in her 50s. But uh, Liz and I, uh, we're very close for a while, but as happens quite often in this business, especially after a while, sometimes you tend to grow apart or you lose touch with one another. So I hadn't seen her for quite a number of years, but, uh, but I wanted to share this because uh, uh, her death brought back many, many, many fond memories. Liz was also so, uh, uh, so much behind uh, the effort that my cousin Charlie and I were making to get this first feature off the ground, that she even invested a small amount of money in the picture. And she lived in, uh, I lived in Malibu Canyon uh, for 11 years, and she lived in Malib Malibu proper, uh, right next door to Barbara Streisand, as a matter of fact, they were, they were neighbors. So uh, we would get together at her home and she'd come up to my house on occasion. But she was a wonderful actress. She went on to do Sisters, a television series called Sisters. She was in Dante's Peak. Uh, she was in uh, uh, Stargate. Uh, uh, what was the name of that series? Stargate. Uh, SG-1. Right, SG-1. Nuts with Barbara Streisand, interestingly. Her neighbor. She played the character of uh, Catherine Langford. Yeah, God, she was. Anyway, she I, was remember, I remember her. Yeah, she was a wonderful human being. And uh, and if anybody uh, hasn't seen Fear No Evil, uh, the film is worth seeing, in my opinion, if for nothing else. I should see her. I should do a show on that one and invite you on. Well, and because uh, I do have it, I have the movie. Um, right. It's just this one. It's it's it is my favorite film to talk about every Halloween. I always bring it up. 
It's my favorite ghost story movie. Number one. <laughs> Love hearing Number it. One favorite. Can't hear but, it. Um, um, so let's let's see what's the next one here. Okay. Who is that guy? <laughs> yeah, who is that guy? No crazy hair. <laughs> All right, this is a lovely story behind this as well. As I mentioned earlier, uh, once again, this I dug this out of a, uh, a box and putting together the website. This was 1974. And my third short film was a 16 millimeter, 27 uh, minute long dramatic film called Gabriel that I wrote, produced, directed, and also wrote the music for. And I even performed in it. And uh, I had sent the film out to uh, the Atlanta Film Festival to and entered it in the short film uh, category, and it won a gold medal at the Atlanta Film Festival. So I was 20 years old here. It was a pretty heady time. And the festival invited me to come to uh, to pick up my award. And so here I am with uh, the babe, <laughs> the babe next to me, you know, the perennial babe who's, who is there handing out the awards to the winners, looking like I'm gobsmacked, you know, uh, via, via all of the attention. And, uh, and it was a wonderful time. And while there, uh, as a matter of fact, I remember that a film, uh, Paul Mazursky was there that year with his film, Harry and Tonto. And the star of that film was Art Carney. And so Art Carney was Art there. Art Carney. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so at this, at this stage uh, in my life, I had finished two years at university, at the University of Miami. And I, my plan always was to go to the University of Miami, where I had a full scholarship for the second year I was there. And... Uh, and leave and go to Southern California, go to Los Angeles to get serious about things. So this was right on the cusp. This was August of uh, 1974. And immediately thereafter, I got in my car and went to Los Angeles. Um, and so uh, uh, once again, just a, an interesting, unique uh, piece of history. The other thing I wanted, I wanted to mention here is that while at this festival, now, I had made one other short film, two other short films, but the one prior to Gabriel was a 16 millimeter short film called Willow Point. While I was at this festival, I met two distributors that ran a company in New York for non-theatrical films called Phoenix Films. And they distributed their films to universities, to colleges. And they were all, there was no videotape back then you know, they would sell these prints uh, 16 millimeter prints for educational purposes and uh and we got together because they were highly impressed by gabriel and they wanted to make a deal with me to distribute gabriel so that was my first encounter with a distributor you know and uh then they asked to see my second short film will appoint as well and they liked that as well so they drafted up a contract right i'm all excited and I, I went over it, looked at it, had never had any experience with, with distribution. Signed off and they said, well, you're going to make some money. You know, this is the way we're going to split the profits. Well, I had made half the money back that uh, was invested in Gabriel. It cost $10,000 and I had raised it from family, friends and, and uh, other people who knew me to make the film. And once the film was completed, I actually took it, a 16 millimeter print, while I was at the University of Miami, set up appointments at universities, at libraries, any, any place that had 16 millimeter libraries that these guys, these two, dis, this, these distributors, Phoenix Films, sold their material to. And I sold enough prints at 350 bucks a shot to return 5000 Dollars worth of the ten thousand dollar investment that my investors have made in Gabriel, but as soon as I signed this deal with these two SOBs, I never saw another dime. So that was my first big lesson in the distribution screw you gang, you know? Yeah. And it was, and it was the lesson I learned. Uh, 
I learned uh, well as a result. So from that point on, I was absolutely uh, and always uh, distrustful of uh, studios. And rightly so. Right, and rightly, rightly so. so. All right, this is a, a, a lovely little piece of history. Right after the film was fully cast, the production company that my cousin Charlie and I had set up to, uh, to make Lady and White, uh, we created this flyer. At the, it's maybe a little larger than 8 by 10 and sent it along to uh, many of the stockholders. So here you have all of the cast uh, included here in this flyer once the, the cast was finally completed all together for the first time ever. And as you can see, we used all of their headshots because not a, not a frame of footage had been shot yet for the for the feature for the film so this was our announcement that uh, that we were fully cast and moving forward with the show and that is really cool and um i like that the you didn't change the font because <laughs> it's an excellent font for the uh title well um, actually uh, i uh selected that font and we used it i believe also in a, an earlier poster uh earlier poster art that we had created also to uh to uh to kind of uh, um, get the uh, stockholders excited and the stockbrokers excited full color art and i had selected this font <clears throat> uh when goldwin samuel goldwin picked up the picture for foreign sales they liked it and they decided to use it so you're right this is the exact same font that gold i didn't insist that they do so New it's a century, snow white font and i think it's perfect yeah yeah new century vista the theatrical distributor used an entirely different approach which different i like approach. too but i think it looks more scary yeah and the story shouldn't it's, it's not really scary well the, the image you have on on uh, as a background image behind this image is mm -hmm. from the mgm dvd i hate that font that uh that's again not, it's a horror font it's, yeah, it's but new series, so new series is is the story. theatrical distributors uh, campaign I liked very very much, and I had a lot a lot a lot of say in what they did with that campaign, and they used an entirely different font. But uh, with that campaign, uh, we went with this the image of Frankie in the half up against the half room window in the cloakroom, and that's become, I think, the iconic image associated with the film. Now. Yeah. Now I want to point something out. By the way, that there are photos here. You have three people in particular who I was a big fan of for years. Uh, Lynn Carew, who is right. just fantastic. Uh, he played. Um, well, I don't want to give it away, um, but he's an uncle in the film. Right. Well, yeah. he's he's not really the adoptive uh, uncle, sort of like that. he works there, and and but I that, know that's, that's interesting because. Uh, many people who see the film refer to him as Uncle Phil, but he's not. He's he not just went to school with them. They grew like up that. together. Blah blah blah. Yeah, right. and but that's like family because my friends are my family. And but you got Alex Rocco right. from The Godfather in there playing your dad right. in the story, and then you got Catherine Hellman from right. Soap. Right, I love that woman. Uh, just I adored her. Well, and Catherine what was Hellman it like working with her? What she was lovely. She was lovely. She was, uh, we had met, uh, my cousin Charlie and I had met her during the course of making Fear No Evil because one of the backers on Fear No Evil knew Catherine and her husband, David Christian. And so uh, we were introduced to, uh, to them by uh, this fellow, one of the backers on Fear No Evil, and we hit it off. And uh, so that's how she became involved. That's amazing, dude. You know, and you did something. You set out to do something and you did it. And I love the fact that you're a lot like some of my favorite directors. You're involved with every aspect of the filmmaking, from the writing, the directing, to even the composition uh, music. Because I personally believe the person who understands how the music should sound is the director. And that's why I like it when the directors know music. And I've been to ask you, what? What instrument were you trained on? Piano. 
but I, I was barely trained on piano. When I was a kid, I studied piano on and off for about two years. And, uh, and so I, I'm anything but an accomplished pianist, but I learned how to play by ear well enough that during the lean years, I played piano bar at, uh, uh, where is it? Where, it was an Italian restaurant, <laughs> of course, in Los Angeles. I believe it still exists called Michelli's. And I played in, primarily in Burbank, but occasionally in Hollywood. And then when I came came out here, uh, just for the fun of it, I also played uh, played uh, at some restaurants out here. But I, I learned to play by ear, and uh, and so uh, and music was always very very important to me when it comes, even as it relates to the short films. I'll, I composed the music for the short films as well. This shot is uh wonderful. that's christopher lee man yeah that's christopher lee standing to the right this happened in um, 1980 i believe it was 1989 uh goldwyn whom i'd mentioned earlier the samuel goldwyn company had picked up the foreign distribution rights sales rights to uh lady in white and they submitted the film to a festival in france for consideration called the festival of imagination and uh the festival accepted the film as part in their competition and they invited me to come uh for the uh the ceremonies for the screenings and also for the award ceremony so i i went and i spent a wonderful week in the french alps in a wonderful little town called clermont ferrand france and uh, the head of the jury, the president of the jury, was Christopher Lee, uh, someone who I'd admired for years and years and years. And we had lunch together every day, Chris and I. He was there with his wife, Gita. And we got to know each other quite well. He was a lovely man. People ask me what he was like. And I, I must say that uh, he, was, he was really a, a prince of a human being, very... Uh, he loved to discuss uh, uh, history, you know, he, and he was less inclined to talk. And I, I was less inclined as well. I didn't really want to put him on the spot in that regard to talk about his films. But in any right. case, in that last shot, that was at the final awards ceremony where the picture picked yeah, I had to ask you what's in your hands there, too. That that was the, uh, the prize for best film of the festival. <laughs> it was an original sculpture. Uh, and it's a spaceship. And there's a, I still have it. Okay. It's a spaceship that was handcrafted, sculpted specifically as the, as the award to be presented to the winner of best film at the festival. And inside of there's actually a little spaceman in the, in the cockpit. Oh, know. wow. It's fabulous. And so Do you still have Chris, it? Yes, I still have it. This was Chris. Uh, he had uh, just prior, just, presented me with that award and and said that uh, lady had won best picture and just as another quick aside it it was so fabulous the way all of this happened the, the festival was run by uh, uh, a particularly young group of people but the guy who ran the festival who, who put it all together was uh, was older very nice fellow but the day of the award ceremony suddenly there was all this excitement among this group of people that I had gotten to know that were handlers at the festival. And they were insisting that I go and get my hair cut and that I buy a nice shirt. And I said, well, what's this No all crazy about? hair, I, Frank. You know, they wanted me to look my best. So they they all but gave away. They knew, you know, that the picture would, they didn't, they didn't tell me, but they all but gave it away. So by the time we got to the ceremony, it was an auditorium filled with maybe about six, seven, eight hundred 800 people. I don't know, it was a large auditorium uh i i had pretty much figured it out because how could you not <laughs> they, they were primping and pretty but it was so lovely it was just so endearing that they were that much in love with the film and wanted wanted me to look my best you know and be ready for for the honors that were about to be that's spent. fantastic and you, to get to meet christopher lee because he's one of those men that i have admired oh, my absolutely. whole life absolutely um but this is again from uh, you were a pizza boy in this one. You're a pizza delivery guy. Oh yeah, that's from Fun uh, with Dick and Jane. 
hold on a second because I'm just noticing that this this is my husband's computer and he uh, doesn't didn't have the power cord connected and I just got a ba batteries about to oh a, a warning <laughs> I plugged it in anyway so we should be okay so this is uh, the um, phone company robbery scene yeah this is uh, another another angle here you see Jane Fonda on the right and between myself and uh, George Siegel it's a wonderful character actor you see him kind of peeking out from a yeah Louis Gus a wonderful wonderful guy and we got to be friends afterwards after that day uh, on the set and he can be seen excuse me he has a he has a featured role in Moonstruck but he, he was in any number of films, you know, a fine character actor. And uh, his passion, I remember this quite succinctly, uh, was a play that he had written about the actor who had the starring role in De Sica's The Bicycle Thief. And the play was about this actor who was a non-actor, who had this uh, enormous moment of fame and fortune and then just disappeared, you know, never did anything ever again. And he was uh, he was trying desperately to get the show up and running, uh, a production of the show. And the, the thing about that subject matter, uh, it particularly touched me because I, I consider even then, I, and up to this day, if I had to name a favorite film, it's a silly question, but I have many favorite films, but I think the film that I've loved most uh, 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 throughout my life, is De Sica's The Bicycle Thief. And Louis, uh, and so Louis, had, Louis had written this play. The, the actual, the original title is The Bicycle Thieves in Italian. In the U.S., uh, they called it The Bicycle Thief. So Louis, uh, Louis was a wonderful, uh, just a wonderful surprise gift. You know, here I was, I only worked on that show that one day. And, uh, but it was lovely meeting, meeting Louis and getting to know him, being friends with him. Louis Gus was his name. Yeah, he's a very recognizable face. Yeah. Um, let's see, what is that? Okay. And this is crazy, crazy hair. Come on. Yeah. Come on. Well, there's a story about it. Uh, behind that after i'd made my short film uh my second short film willow point the local newspaper the rochester democratic chronicle wanted to do a story about it so they came to my parents home now i was 16 at the time and you see me here with two my two 35 millimeter carbon arc uh projectors in the basement of my parents home behind the wall i'm standing in front of is a cinema that my dad and I built. And these two projectors, these two project, I had 35 millimeter prints that I used to run all the time. I had a print of The Graduate. I had a print of Midnight Cowboy. I had, uh, I had, oh gosh, Carnal Knowledge. I had uh, Requiem for a Heavyweight. I had the, all these 35 millimeter prints. Those two projectors came about when uh, I was 14. And I wanted to uh, set up a 35 millimeter uh, cinema down in the basement. And uh, I found out about these two uh, uh, portable, so-called portable projectors that were for sale in Detroit. We lived in Rochester. I told my dad about them. And we drove up with a cousin of his who had a large enough vehicle to pack them into in case we decided to buy them. And my beautiful father, bought them for me at $250. And they were and they were dismantled. You can see they're on very heavy bases. And then we got them back, put them all back together again. You see the two little boxes behind each one? Those are generators to run the carbon arc lamp How could you have that in a basement? Well, uh, fortunately, the basement was an unfinished basement. My father had always thought about making it, turning it into a rec room of sorts. But uh, we had a fireplace up above on the main living level. And because he thought about uh, finishing this base basement at some point, he extended the fireplace into the basement. Lucky, luckily for us, 
fireplace was just to the left of where you see the projectors in another adjoining space. So we, you see the 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 uh, the tubing the, that uh, where the exhaust from the the uh, projector is needed to escape from. We hooked that up to to the fireplace. Fireplace. Yeah, I was about to say because like so, that's got to go yeah. somewhere. Yeah, so whenever I ran those projectors, people, uh, I'm sure neighbors might have thought, if they weren't aware of what was going on down there, that we uh, we had a fire going, even during the summer months, because smoke would <laughs> would, would come out of the fire bay, uh, the chimney at the top of the roof. So my dad was just spectacular in that way. He was, uh, he was always, uh, you know, I think he, after a while, because here is his, this crazy kid of his, who had this passion for movies and decided he was going to make movies, you know, at a very young age and started with eight millimeter and then moved to 16 millimeter. Plus he was acting and all that, getting all the leads in the high school production. As a matter of fact, Willow Point, I had gone off to college and Willow Point uh, was entered in the uh, Kodak Teenage Movie Awards competition and won uh, a major award. I can't remember uh, one of the best short film categories. And uh, since I wasn't around, I said, Dad, would you please go and accept the award for me? So uh, as you know, Angelo in Lady in White was based on my father. My father right. was an iron worker, just as Angelo is in the film. He created these beautiful wrought iron railings and lamp posts. And my father, I, I remember my mother telling me that he was so proud and went up and it's wonderful that he got to do that, to accept the award for his son, everybody applauding his son, because he unfortunately died before I go, he got to see either of the features. He died before we made uh, Fear No Evil. So he never got to see Lady and White. N neither did uh, my, my two grandparents, uh, Mama, Papa, Mama and Papa, Mama Sinta and Papa Charlie. Wow. So anyway, um, this was the theater in in the basement the 35 uh, or at least the rear of it the projection room yeah that's amazing okay just hanging around what's going on here and this was the very last day of the shoot on lady in white unfortunately oh for the flo floating scene right in the dream yeah right well we shot we were shooting uh um one some of the last setups had to do with uh, the lady in white and Melissa, Karen Paul, my dear friend, Karen Paul played the title character, uh, floating in, this, in the sky backdrop and eventually making their way skyward. So they were on flying rigs. And uh, so this had to be the last day or maybe the second to last day. And the crew decided that it was lunchtime and they tricked me into hooking me up that they hooked me up to the flying ring and the bastards left and closed the stage door behind me <laughs> and they all went to lunch but they came back to get me after a little bit and left me there on a dark stage in the flying ring <laughs> well That's great. there i am there i am <laughs> oh this, yes the billboard this is another wonderful memory. This was a billboard that the theatrical distributor uh, decided to erect on Sunset Boulevard and Doheny Drive in Los Angeles. You can see there's another billboard behind uh, Willow had opened at the same time that Lady did. And this was such a grand gesture, a wonderful gesture on the part of uh, the distributor, New Century Vista, particularly uh, the publicity department and the head of the company, Norman Levy, because he had to approve it. How many theaters did it end up in? Well, in LA and the surrounding area, I think it was about 70, 80 theaters when it opened. Did yeah. it get a national uh, di yeah. distribution? Yeah. I remember it seeing played, it the they, uh, they platformed it. So it was supposed to open in uh, in Los Angeles, New York, and Chicago at the same time. And they were rolling out, I think, about 200 prints to do that. But then at the last minute, the company, unfortunately, was having financial difficulties. And at the last minute, they decided to pull out of New York and wait to open New York so they could use the prints they were using in L.A. 
in Chicago uh, and shipped them to New York and opened New York later. And, uh, and so it opened in New York about a month after, month to six weeks after it opened in, in, uh, in, uh, in Los Angeles and Chicago. And it opened in other parts of the country as well. So when I say Chicago, that means the entire Midwest. And when I say Los Angeles, that would include San Francisco, Oregon, the West Coast, okay? And uh, New York is, of course, the East Coast. So yes, it had a theatrical run, a very limited run uh, theatrically, but it opened all across the country. On the website, there are print articles from all across the, um, the country, all across the world, as relates to the pictures, theatrical runs. Um, I do, by the way, I've, I've neglected our audience. Um, uh, I wasn't sure if anybody would be able to show up because we don't normally uh, do shows on Thursdays. But I need this special because I know you're doing a special showing this weekend there in Italy of your film. And so we couldn't have you on Saturday. Right. And um, so I'm grateful that you, you did do this. And, yeah, I can see why you hate that font. I look at it it's like oh, yeah, that, that's the D the, that's the MGM DVD MGM one. cut. And I told now them, you I, did get to work with Samuel Goldwyn, but not father, but son. You worked with Junior. Yeah, right? but I, I oddly enough, I didn't really meet him. He was peripheral to the company. Uh, uh, he really didn't have much to do with the company. He, he remained the company's namesake via the his father. Yeah, uh, he was more involved with Samuel Goldwyn Films or studio. Uh, which was yeah. a separate no, studio. But, no, but that, no, no, it was the Samuel Goldwyn, they had a production arm as well. Yeah, they had a distribution and production arm. The guy that ran... Uh, uh, which one did you work with? No, it's the same company. Just one company, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But uh, I've neglected our audience, and I want to say hi to everybody. We've got Jace here, he's a good friend of mine. He is... Um, I make uh, I use a clip from the thing with him because uh, I don't know what it is uh, about my friends from from uh, the Netherlands. Uh, where's it at? I got to play it because uh, if I'm going to mention, I have to play it. Where's it at? Where's it at? Uh, here it is. Hey Sweden, not Swedish, Mac and Norwegian. It's at Norway. Because <laughs> I've got a couple of friends from Norway. And uh, Jace is one of them, and uh, Andre is the other one. He has a probably one of the most successful um, shows like what we do uh, going uh, with Midnight's Edge. Yep. Uh, and I'm sure he's going to check this show out because uh, he, he likes the film too. And uh, But I want to make sure that I say hello to everybody that has shown up. Vinkman's Girl is here. Lady V Elements is here. Penny is here. She actually popped in uh, after she got her hair done today. <laughs> She's um, um, a friend of ours, mother, and uh, she watches our show. She, you know, he's got his own show, but she always watches our show. <laughs> it's yeah. more fun. Uh, let's see who else popped in. War monkey. Hey, if you need a monkey, you want one for war. That's what <laughs> I need my monkey that's ready to fight. <laughs> so uh, they're regulars of ours, and we're going to get a lot more. We'll end up probably with a. Uh, a few hundred views on this by the end of the weekend because people have a tendency of liking to trail in and watch our show after it's already aired mm -hmm. and um i know that the last time you were on i think there was close to 700 views on that video yeah, for us great. which is pretty good and that's yeah. just on youtube now we're on rumble too and we're getting a lot of attention on rumble they they like me because i'm a jerk and uh, for some reason jerks do well in this uh, on live here, 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 here. Yeah, here, here. <laughs> By the way, I want to remind everybody: uh, visit his website. It's yep. Frank Laloja dot com. Uh, what? How what's it again? How much loja did you put in there? A laloja. Frank Laloja dot com. <laughs> and uh, and we will bring you back. I'm going to have you back, and we're going to talk about fear. Don't no threaten evil. me. I will threaten you. <laughs> Um, and you're just listen, such a lovely I got person to say to Martin. I'm sorry that someone dropped a house on your sister, Martin, but you <laughs> should have grown up in the flesh. Oh and I got, enough, I got something else to say to Keith. 
Did you know that Keith is so old that when he was born, the Dead Sea was just sick? And here's one for Gary. Gary, he's so old that when he went to an antique auction, three guys bid on him. When he went to an antique auction, three guys bid on him. We are at the middle of the show. Hello, good evening, and welcome to the middle of the film. I love Monty Python. Did you like Monty Python? Are you speaking to me? Yeah. Uh, yes, I did, but I'm I'm not I'm not a huge fan of. Them. I mean, I like them, but uh, I have a bit of a connection to John Cleese uh, since you bring up Monty Python. Okay. As an actor, I was in the very first American attempt to recreate Faulty Towers. Faulty Towers with Maud. Um, B. B. Arthur. No, not Maud. No, it was a show called Snavely with Harvey Corman in the John Cleese. Uh, uh, role. I've never heard of this one. Betty White as his wife, and guess who was third in? Third you were the you were the uh, waiter, Mag uh, right. Miguel Manuel. Manuel, but I was, Manuel, not, but I was called. Good. I was an Albanian refugee. Uh, did they, named, what name did they give you? Petro, Petro. Petro. And uh, so we did. Oh, that's nice. Everything, everything's mirror image dinner. Yeah, he does that for copyright because we get hit all the time. <laughs> but uh, so in any case, uh, uh, and we did that in 1978. It was for ABC, and. Uh, and that was when I, I officially quit acting, you know, pursuing any acting role because I needed to devote my energies to getting Fear No Evil going. Up oh, and there you are, getting out of the cab. Um, how am I? Oh wait, no, that's the driver. Who he didn't shit on. I'm kind of nervous now. Pardon me. You just shit on the whole panel except me. I'm nervous now. Why would I do that? You're too gorgeous and too sweet and lovely. Yeah, yeah. but it's what we do. We shit on each other. No, that's what friends sure do. Not. It is. I've it's a rule of being a good friend. Is, is I, I might up. I might pull your leg a bit, but I would I would. But yeah, if you'd like, I, I I could come up. Give me a second. I'll come up with something. <laughs> there you go. That's close up. That's that's Frank Lelogia right there. Because yeah. uh, you played yourself in it, and you're the narrator in the film. Yep. And you did a fantastic I an job. <laughs> I had an actor ready to go for this. But the the crew convinced me to do it. They said, you know, come on, this is it's, a, it's so much you. It's about it's about so much. You may as well play exactly. you exactly. So I said, okay. So I did it, and I had the uh, wonderful pleasure of working with uh, Bruno Kirby, who played the cabbie. Oh, Bruno! You know, Bruno was just terrific, and he flew in from Los Angeles just to do that that small part but there are no small parts only small actors and he brought so much such a wonderful gravitas and presence with his voice and, and the brief time he spent on the screen and he just loved the script he said frank because i was almost uh you know i had him in and i i was almost embarrassed to ask him to do it it's a minor or at least as far as the written page was concerned but he did he did it and he made it he really made it memorable so he, he was, we lost him to leukemia which is what killed my mother too it's just terrible no but this this is bruce kirby not bruno oh bruce kirby bruno was it was his son right yeah because i love bruno <clears throat> bruno was his son but his dad had appeared i didn't know his dad was actually Bru bruno kirby Right. Okay. But his dad had appeared in many, many films on television shows. I mean, he was a very well-known character. Mm -hmm. Visually, when you said, well, all you got to do is go back to that era. Anyway. Man. Yeah, I love the small town. It reminded me of where I grew up. <sighs> By the way, you don't need to be concerned about 
in the future, I'm just telling you, you don't need to be concerned about copyright in a situation like this. These images are all over the internet. And there's no problem utilizing them. It's 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 actually the people who re-released your film that's the problem. Um, they have been total dicks to us. They we've had to pull your trailer. Uh, anytime I show your trailer, they 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 gank us. And who who are you speaking of? Um, I forget it. They're the ones that are doing uh, MST three K. Uh, Keith, who is that? That company? Oh, jeez. Um... They're they're doing a lot of new releases, of film. and no, but M MGM owns the rights to the film. Nobody else has the rights. To the, I sold MGM uh, the rights uh, back in around uh, 2014, 2015. So I've never heard of these people. I don't know who the hell they are. But I'll they find out no, who it is. They have no right. Uh, if they're who you're telling me they are. They had no right to tell you anything. It's it's apparently hold on here it is here it is it's um Scream Factory, um, which I think they're owned by MG. Gary's been claimed no. for using his own music, so no, no, no. Scream I should because you know I, I do music too. No, Scream Factory, Scream Factory, uh, had an output deal with uh, with MGM to release the film on Blu-ray. And they have no rights to the picture at this point. But they're the ones, yeah. every single time I show something of yours that they have any association with, they have put a claim against us. So I've had to pull it. But, um, and I don't like, I love Screen Factory, but I also hate them at the same time because they've got a problem. But well, Anima just brought it up because you know I'm a, a music composer too. Uh, and uh, I play drums and piano and, and uh, you know, keyboards. And um, we played one of my songs on the show. And I got called claimed for one of my own songs. They had a claim, a well, copyright claim against us, and I'm like, they, this is they have no no right. To, it's YouTube. It's YouTube, really YouTube. YouTube just hates content creators. It's it, they really do. They're dicks. Now, did that really happen? I got to ask you the whole concrete scene. Did it really happen in what regard? We stayed because I've done something like that, and I was just curious is that something that happened to you with the concrete where you got no, covered in concrete? No, no that didn't because that shit was funny. I laughed my ass off because when you get that stuff in your spokes, you've got to hose it off immediately, right? Yep, as a matter of fact, somebody recently commented that the bike would never have been able to move, but no, it's too heavy. If that, yeah, so but uh. You know, some people are just, they, they really, they make me laugh, you know. Because oh, the nitpickers? They, they, yeah, all the nitpickers. Everybody's got something to nitpick about. And some, As a matter of fact, I went to Letterboxd a couple of days ago. This time of year, Halloween, lots of people are watching the film. Many people are discovering the film for the first time. And one, one review on, on Letterboxd. Uh, stated it was like a one-line review and they oh, something I forgot what the first part of it, but the second part just had me uh, rolling in the aisle. She said, and whoever wrote the music for this film is a lunatic. <laughs> <laughs> now, did a you lunatic. actually compose with uh, sheet music? I, I, how did you I do swear it? to God, it was like I forgot what she said prior, but it was like one sentence, you know, no caps, no no period at the end. It's just blah 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 blah. And the guy who wrote the music is a lunatic. <laughs> <It's> a lunatic. <laughs> By the way, Shinovsky says that Anima isn't that sweet with me. Um hold on, let me answer to that. Yeah, go respond to him. <laughs> of course, I will. Oh, the there response is here. Yeah, there it is. Oh, you should not ski. <laughs> wow, wow. That's the only thing that I can find fast. It's in my muscle memory. Wow. Everything else I have to look for. This one, no. So, um, anyway, uh, I remember those masks, by the way, because I'm a few years younger than you. Uh, when you were making it in 77, I was in Europe. I lived in e the UK. I lived in Ireland and England. No, it was um, 80, 86 that we were shooting. No, not this movie, but when you were talking earlier about uh, working in film, the film in uh, 70, uh, uh. 77, 78 for, for um, uh, uh, Fun with Dick and Jane. I'm oh, like, yeah. I wasn't even in the States. I saw Fun with Dick and Jane right after my return. 
uh, wow. after I got back. But uh, I remember the Bella Lugosi mask. Right. And uh, my mask at the time, though, I had the the um, Batman mask, the Adam West Batman mask. And I kept cutting my tongue on it because I would talk and then stick my tongue through the little hole and it would always slice <laughs> my tongue. But I remember mask, a lot of this stuff, man. That mask was created specifically for the film. At my request. Um, Bella Lugosi, because there was a Bella Lugosi mask. I remember yeah, the Dracula and I Frankenstein. Wanted, what I wanted was <clears throat> there's a shot in Dracula. It's an extreme close up where he's coming down. In, in Dracula, Lucy is Mina, I believe, as opposed to being Lucy. And yeah, they Lucy. flip the characters. Yeah. And, uh, and so it's a tight close up of Lugosi, and he's got this grimace, you know on his face as he's coming down to bite her neck. And uh, I called my friend R.J. Silverthorne, who uh, did all of the, uh, he was head of makeup, and particularly effects makeup on Fear No Evil. And uh, I asked him if he could create a mask uh, for me that was uh, right off that, that frame. And he did. And so that's that's how that mask came about. That and, explains it. Okay. Yeah. And there's there was there's a wonderful young man. Uh, well, he, he was a very young man back then by the name of Rod Matsui, who was his assistant. He was just a kid at the time, and he went on to do special effects makeup in in movies afterwards. And uh, and he is a Facebook friend, and he has wonderful recollections of putting that mask together with uh, with rj he worked on that mask that is so and cool. then i made the idiotic mistake uh of gifting the mask i, I kept it it was encased in a uh, plexiglass uh box you know to protect it and uh it had the, it was uh, see-through plexiglass and this uh, kind of I have photos of it as a matter of fact and Andy Lamarca who was the co-producer of the film was celebrating I think his maybe his 40th birthday and I decided I loved Andy and I decided I was gonna give it to him and I did so I gave it to him and then tragically God, it's probably been about 10 years now maybe a little less he passed away uh, he died of a heart attack. It was shocking. Wow. At a very young age. And uh, after a number of years passed, I, I contacted his wife, who happened to have been the still photographer, the production photographer on Lady in White. That's where they met, Marsha Blackburn. And I asked her about the mask. And, uh, and she said, what mask? And I said, uh, Frankie's mask. She worked on the film. I said, Frankie's mask, the mask I gave to Andy at his 40th birthday party. And she said, I have no re recollection of any mask. And so uh, I don't know what happened to it because I was hoping I might be able to get it back, you know, but, um, but it's seemingly lost. I would think that it's, it's probably stuck away. She admitted that they had moved a number of times, you know, and, and then another mutual friend of ours who worked on the film said it's probably in storage somewhere, but she had no. And this was a number of years after he died, so I waited. I wasn't about to go to her. Yeah. Trouble her. But uh, she had no inclination whatsoever. She didn't, whether she was lying to me or, or just being vindictive, I never quite liked it, to tell you the truth. <clears throat> but I wasn't mean to her or rude to her. Uh, so it's lost and it breaks my that heart. really sucks, dude. It really does. Yeah. I hate hearing that. By the way, uh, I am from the same era of growing up with coat rooms in our schools. Echo. And uh, those things would freak me out, man, going in there. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I hated it. And that's why this brings back memories. I hated coat rooms. Well, the whole, the whole Lady in White began with this. You see this image of the window. Thank you. That's that's where it began. Uh, the image of Frankie right there in the cloakroom window. 
uh, that was the first visual image that came to me as I was thinking about what to do next. Because my, my cousin had come to me and said, I think we might be able to make another film independently by going public. So I'm not going to worry as to how that occurred, but we did. We went public, we traded our stock on NASDAQ specifically to raise the money to make Lady and White independently. And uh, so he said, what do you want to do? And I knew that what I wanted to do was create something that was autobiographical, that was personal this time, and that was driven by my love of family, my past, uh, what I had experienced growing up. And that's how Lady and White came about. It had to be commercial as well. So uh, the ghost story was a wonderful framework. Because uh, uh, it's a famous story, the Lady in White. To build, yeah, every town, every town's got a Lady in White. And we had our own. Uh, Lady in White legend in upstate New York and Rochester in particular. But it, the story had very little to do, if anything at all, with what I created here. It was an entirely different take. But um, creating um, use as the framework uh, on which to build a film that was personal and autobiographical a film I really wanted to see and make, you know, that's, that's how that happened. And he was game with that because he had to be excited about what we were doing as well, because he needed to get out there. We both got out there to pitch the stockbrokers, you know, to pitch the stock to their clients. We created a 10 minute promo reel to do that before the picture was shot. And I, flying all over the country to visit these little brokerage firms and meet the, the guys that ran the firms and, and these penny stock brokers. We'd set up screenings of the little 10 minute promo reel and at their local theater. We'd book the theater and go in there in the morning before the shows began. And they'd all come down and look at it. And that's how we, we got them excited about going out and selling our stock. And as a result of doing that, we raised $4.7 million and shot the picture independently. That's the way to do it, man. That is the way to do it. Anima, uh, share that story, please. <laughs> um, when I started high school, I was 11 and I was bullied. And we had a code room next to our classroom. And my bullies thought it was funny to catch me and just hang me up in the code room on a hook. In, at the sling at the back of, of my of the neck of my coat so when you when you hung up like that you can't get out of the jacket because the buttons were closed at the front and i sort of couldn't open them because of the tension so and this, the sling wouldn't break i tried so hard but i'm a lightweight so i hung down all period until someone found me the next break it's funny That's looking true. back but it, it wasn't funny it wasn't time. funny at the time no, no it was uh, speaking the of that scare me the coat room scene Really, your visual matching on this was really well done. For the uh, blue screen, this is really well done stuff here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, these effects, the, the cloakroom ghost effects work very well. <clears throat> we have problems. You know, I had a $200,000 budget for 200 separate effect shots. Optical printer necessitated shots. The blue screen, they were composites, black background composites. Uh, that amounts to $1,000 a shot. You know, every cut when it comes to effects, you know, in a film is considered a separate shot because wow. that means they have to line up everything, uh, all of the mats, you know, all the rotoscoping, everything. Every time a cut of, uh, occurs, even at the same shot, it's the same extended shot that's intercut with other shots throughout the sequence. So that amounted to a thousand bucks a shot, which is not even close to enough to really do the, the job that needed to be done. Well, people don't understand a lot of times because uh, um, my dad had a continuity eye. He was good about continuity. 
in film, and he would criticize films on continuity. And that uh, was uh, something that got handed over to me. And I caught a little continuity thing here, and I always meant to ask you, because when you do the reverse vent shot, where you're looking out of the vent up and out, right. it's round, whereas when you're looking down at the vent, it's it's rectangular. <laughs> and Oh, that's not oh. true. <laughs> The, That's my eye. I, I inherited that well, from my dad. The op that was correct because the opening you're absolutely is rectangular, right. but the pipe is round. That's right. There we so go. You're seeing you're seeing Frankie. There's a pipe. There's a big a big uh, pipe. You know that pushes yep. the, the heated air through. That's, Here's the that's dream great. sequence that I like. Uh, we we were rewatching that scene so often, trying to figure that out. So thanks. Now we know. Yeah, this is one of the scenes that really disappointed me as to the uh, blue screen. And that's the other thing. We had a guy by the name of Ernie, because you can see all the matte lines on Frankie's hair, even during that uh, that time period, it could have been done much better. And the reason that now, if you gave it somebody like me today, I could actually go in and clean that up today. But, but partly, the, partly uh, the reason that happened, at least partly so, is that when we lit the scene, uh, light leaked where it shouldn't have onto, onto his person. And uh, I had the guy from the effects house who was on set with us every day that we shot the blue screen. He was being paid to be there. It was a guy by the name of Ernest Farina. And... Um, and he fucked it up. Now, we didn't know it when we were shooting. We, you know, we counted on him and relied on him to make sure that those blue screen shots were properly lit and there was no light bleed that could interfere with the optical printing. And he assured us that that was the case. He was there on the set for all of that material. And, uh, and the, you know something? Everybody on the show was so wonderful. He was the only one who had a fucking bug up his ass. I don't know what his problem was, but he was a he was nothing but a pain in the ass throughout the entire show. I should have gotten rid of him for that reason alone. And then I suffered, and the film suffered as a result. Now, that could have been handled better, nonetheless, if more time were taken and more money were spent in post by the time they got to the optical printing. But it caused for real, real problems. Uh, and that had to do with his not properly supervising those shots and making sure that uh, that the blue screen material we shot was, was well lit enough to avoid this problem. So, and I still hate the son of a bitch. For, <laughs> for and I never had anything to do with him afterwards. I mean, I stayed in, in touch with quite a number of people were very close. On well, if you shoot. still had the original shots with the green screen, I'm telling you, uh, even I, with my experience in working with optical effects, could clean up and, and do a chroma key clean up. No, that, that was blue screen. Green screen was not used for film. Uh, yeah, they were using blue. It was used for television. That was blue But still, screen. I could do it uh, with... No, with... well, I and mean, here's the other thing about Screen Factory and their Blu-ray release. I had a deal with them. I had a, a verbal agreement because they weren't about to go any further than that. But they promised me, I told them, look, I'll work with you on this release. I'll put together the extended director's cut, which was, I thought. Which I, I have a copy of, and I love yeah, it. Uh, for you, I'll help you put all that together. I'll put together an extensive behind the scenes with the VHS material that I have. And I worked, and I said, but all I want you to promise me is that you'll clean up, not all of them, but just the worst, you know, some of these. And that, that particular sequence was what I was thinking of as well as uh, toward the end of the picture. <clears throat> and they agreed to that. And then they uh, they didn't love it, live up to their agreement. You know, they basically said to me, no, it's uh, we're too behind schedule. It's going to cost too much money. So they never intended to live up to their agreement. So... Yeah, I, wanted, like I wanted to clean those up, and digitally, they can be cleaned up now, not to alter the shots in any way as to their conception, 
but to just clean up the clean goddamn nat lines. And there's nothing wrong with doing that. The technology is available. See, I, I wished I'd talked to you about it before you went to him because I could have gotten people in the effects field to help and do it for nothing. So now we're looking at the possibility of a 4K release. Well, so, you and I need and, to talk. Yeah, my hope is that uh, I can be involved with, if it happens, with the people who are doing it, and I can convince them uh, to clean up their shots. And I think it would also be a selling point for the film, you know. Uh, and uh, maybe I shouldn't be saying this at this point, but Vinegar Syndrome it, uh, uh, has expressed an interest in releasing a 4K uh, of the film. And the only problem is they got in touch with, we, we uh, exchanged uh, emails uh, a few weeks back and they got in touch with MGM, or at least told me they did, about six, seven weeks ago, and no response. I followed up asking them about two weeks ago where things were at, and they explained to me, and I, I tend to believe them because I know the way these people operate. They well, they've that, they've put out some good films on 4K, so yeah, no, they seem to be they seem to be uh, acknowledged as. Uh, is a good company when it comes to well they did the prophecy films they right. did daryl because i just got a copy of daryl i love that movie right but no response from mgm yet mm. so we're waiting to see what happens uh, uh let's find out what, whether or not they well if they it. decline to do it please get with me and i'll see if i can find you a team that'll do it for you no, we're talking about a 4K release, and yeah, as as a result of that 4K, oh, you're talking about the effects. The you're effects for cleaning it up. Yeah, yeah. Well, we, we need to find a house, an effects house, <clears throat> that would uh, through CGI, of course, you know. Because I have a lot of friends in that field, and yeah. um, so. But anyway, I just I would love to see the final cut of this film done correctly. Be nice, yeah. And you know, I'd like to see it too before I'm not around because I I'm getting there. You know, I'm not as long. Uh, you're as gonna as outlive as me. me. I'm not as young as uh, you spring chickens mm -hmm. by any means. You got me by a decade, my friend. Because <laughs> you were born in what fifty four? Yeah. 54. Yeah, we're exactly ten years apart. You're the same age as my great. big brother, Steve. Russ did such a nice job, uh, you know, we with the uh, lighting. Uh, we we spent a lot of time discussing. It's got it. such a natural look to it, like The Godfather. Uh, and yeah. I wanted to ask you about that on the lighting. How much of this was artificial and how much was natural? I don't know. Right? Russ augmented every every shot with lighting. Every Every shot. The opening scenes of the film, you know, where the montage of the town. Right. And those were the actual first uh, setups and scenes that we shot. And uh, I'll never forget the, the first day of shooting. We had all these wonderful setups, you know, the crane down uh, from the uh, in the town square with the courthouse behind and then all the uh, all the inserts, uh, you know, the barber uh, sweeping the leaves off uh, his his front uh, entrance, and the tailor, and the and the paper boy on his bike, and all of that, and it was pouring. I mean, downpour, you know, and it was obviously it was cloudy. It was raining like the Dickens. So. Uh, we had to tighten up some of those cutaway uh, action scenes so that Russ could uh, light them as though it was a lovely, bright, uh, sunny fall day. But the truth was it was pouring down rain for many of those setups. Two good actors right here. Yeah, Len Carreyou was... When I was cutting Fear No Evil in New York, Len was starring in, he had created uh, 
the first actor to ever play the role of Sweeney Todd in Sondheim's show on Broadway. And he won the Tony for it. And that year, I was cutting Fear No Evil in New York City. And it was a wonderful year. I spent a year cutting the film there. And I saw everything that was on Broadway and off Broadway. And Sweeney Todd blew me away. And I went back and I saw it five times, three times front row center. <laughs> I remember. Wow. So uh, that's when I became a Sondheim fan. And I remembered Len uh, all those years later. And uh, well, it wasn't that many years later because Sweeney was, when I saw Sweeney, it was 1980 when he was doing the show around Christmas, New Year, New Year's. And uh, anyway, yeah, 1980. Um, originally, I wanted Scott Wilson to play Phil. And I'd gotten in touch with Scott and sent him the script. And we talked repeatedly on the phone. And he was skeptical about getting involved. And he explained to me that even at, at that time, it was 1986, he said, you know, Frank, he said, I, I kind of got typecast there for a while. I didn't get a lot of roles because everybody wanted to cast me as the heavy after in Cold Blood. And he said, so I'm not sure that I want to play as dark a character as Phil is, you know, after Colette. <laughs> Scott, that was what, back in 1960-something, I can't remember. But uh, so he passed. I, I really went to town trying to convince him to do it. And then Len, uh, Lynn Stallmaster, who was the casting director, and I got together, and it suddenly hit me, and I said, what about Len Carrier? And at that point, Len had done the film version of A Little Night Music that Harold Prince directed, which is a horrible, horrible rendition of a beautiful play, cinematic rendition of a beautiful play. And he'd done uh, The Four Seasons, which was directed by Alan Alda, starred Alan Alda as well. Classic film. I love yeah. that movie. So, uh, so we sent Len the script. He was in New York. He read it. He liked it, and then he came out, and we met, and he came on board. And, and I had read Alex Rocco for Angela prior to meeting with Len, <clears throat> and I liked Alex, but it's interesting because I was a bit prejudiced against Alex at the start because he had been cast as a heavy a good deal of the time up to that point. Yep. I'm going to have to buck this. You know, I mean, he gave me a hell of a good reading. And I thought, do I really uh, want to have to deal with this, this image that he created as an actor in general terms? So, uh, but the other part of it was that I, I didn't know who was going to play Phil. And I told him, I said, I've got to, I've got to decide. And, uh, choose who is going to play Phil before I decide who's going to play Angela. He said, because there's got to be a, a chemistry there that I feel will work physically, you know, based on what I think the individual actors are going to bring to their performances. So, uh, and when I was thinking of Scott Wilson, I thought, because Scott was a little younger than, than Al, I thought, I'm not sure that that's going to work. If Scott if Scott says yes, then I'm going to have to think about somebody else for Angela. <clears throat> anyway, when Len said yes, I immediately saw it. I saw them working together and coming together beautifully. So Alex was thrilled because, boy, did he campaign. <laughs> he, he, he was calling me on a regular basis, inviting me out to drinks, you know, prior to my deciding. He dyed his hair to make himself look younger because he thought, and I, I even I thought I thought perhaps he's a little too old, you know. But it all depended on who I, who is who is going to be cast as Phil. And uh, so he was 
he was absolutely thrilled when I said yes. And by the way, Tom Bauer is a really good actor too. By the way, and I really like him. He played the Tom town Wayne. sheriff. Tom, there was an actor in Fear No Evil. His name was uh, Danny Eden. He played the thug Tony in Fear No Evil. And Danny told me, I uh, said, Frank, there are a couple of actors, in particular, there's one you should see. He's doing this play in LA. And he's, he's, I know him, and you should go see him. And I think he'd be right for the film. So I went, and not only was he appearing in the play, but uh, oh gosh, this is terrible. The other mm -hmm. actor who played, uh, who played the, the worker in the shop. I can't think of his name. He played Tony. Anyway, they were both in the same show, and I saw it, and I liked them both, and I cast them both in the show. You um, had another actor, by the way, I'm very fond of, another background actor who was great in One Flew Over the Cuckoo's, and that's a Sidney Lassick. Yeah, sweet Sidney. Yeah, what would you think working with him? Oh, he was marvelous, but the poor Sidney. This was very difficult. Um, I had created my cut of the film and we started to shop it around for a year. There were no bites. I was turned down by everybody. You hear this story all the time. Went to all the studios, smaller, independent distributors. I got a, the only offer I had of any significance, and it was barely significant, was a hundred thousand dollar, no, $125,000 upfront guarantee against the back end deal where I would never have seen another dime from a company called Vestron, which was a small independent distributor at the time. <clears throat> and, uh, and I said, no. And uh, I even went to New York and screened it for Miramax for Harvey Weinstein and his brother, Bob, toward the end of this run of uh, the first go round of trying to secure my distribution deals. And uh, I'll never forget that trip. So we screened the picture and Harvey was flipping out. This is wonderful. This is incredible. I could do this. I want this movie. I want this movie. Now, this was before Miramax had become a huge entity. It was just before they picked up Cinema Paradiso. And that's what really got them on the map. A film they didn't produce. They just picked up. But so Harvey, I said to Harvey, I said, look, um, I said, that's fine. I'm glad you like the film, but I'm going to need a significant amount of an advance. I said, we've spent 4.7 million on this and I'm going to need anything but a back end deal, a real possibility of uh, recouping our money. So if you come to me with a back end deal where I'm going to get screwed, you know, your typical back end deal. I, I said, don't do it. I said, because I'm not going to accept it. And if you're not prepared to offer me a significant amount of cash up front, I'll leave now, go back to LA. He said, no, 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 no. Bob and I got to get together and work out a deal. So just stick around. So I was there with my assistant, Lori Zerwick. We stuck around. Len was appearing in uh, another Broadway show at the time. So we went and saw that, saw Len. And uh, and then finally he calls and he says, okay. He says, we're ready. Come meet us at, uh, at the Sherry Netherland. Was it the Sherry Netherland or the plaza? No, the, the plaza. So Laurie and I went to the plaza. And, and what does he present me with? A back-end deal where I'll never see another dime. And no upfront cash. And I said goodbye. And that was it for a number of months until finally... Uh, I managed to secure three separate deals. One with a company called Version Vision, which was the video cassette arm of uh, Virgin. You know, Brannis, what's his name? Uh, Richard Braddock. Uh, you know, Virgin Airlines. Branson. Branson. Branson's company. He had a video. Uh, Keith has to go. Um, before you go, uh, Keith, you want to say anything to uh, Frank before you go? Uh, you are an incredible storyteller. I could listen to you for hours. 
Uh, well, seriously. Not, I'm starting to run out of steam. I'm not sure if I can. <laughs> well, we're reaching in. We got 10 minutes left before we, yeah. we wrap. Um, and, but uh, Keith was, I, I would to say go. it was nice seeing you, Keith, but I saw you so briefly. Yeah, get on camera again, Keith. Jesus. Oh, God, hold on. I gotta turn on. I gotta turn on the light because no, I was sitting here just watching I, you guys. No, that's all right. Don't worry I about. work with social cowards. No, Keith. Whoa, whoa, <laughs> holy shit! No, Keith, go, go, go back. <laughs> 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 all right, back. Keith. I'll see you later, buddy. Have a good one. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks Bye for Keith. being your brother. Hey, hey, that van has really expanded, hasn't it? Bye, Keith. I mean, it's morphed. It's morphed into a a living in uh, an apartment. Yes, yes, it has. He's at the house and he's got to go do something with Mel, his wife. So um, I'll see you later, buddy. Have a good one. Okay. Keith. Nice seeing you. Actually, I was thinking about Keith. I thought, I wonder if he's going to be there before this happens. He tries Maybe. to be here for all the good stuff. I remember him. Whenever we do something cool, I, I want him here because he, he's, he's the reason why I started doing this show. So, uh, but anyway, so but the anyway, distribution deal, because I, I do have a picture here, by the way, of Vesperon. Uh, that's Vestron Video. Yeah, right. And they went out of business in 1991. Right, shortly thereafter. And they kind of earned it. Yeah, exactly. If you don't want to anyway, put a lot of effort into something, we, we got all our negative costs uh, uh, out of the picture up front. $2 million advance from Virgin for the video rights, $1 million from Advance plus 70% of all foreign sales from Goldwyn. And that on that basis alone, before the picture even opened, we got back our four point seven million dollars, and then it earned for us, gross for us, another three, four, four million. Yeah. So well, one of the rules I've up. learned, Frank, and and I'm sure you'll echo this, is um, it's what you get up front and what you get from the gross that matters. Yeah. Everything else is bullshit. Yeah. Yeah. Net net deals mean. No money. Net back in bullshit. Yeah. You'll never see it. Look at beautiful Renata Vani. I'm telling you, you don't have to do this in the future. This is bullshit. Uh, this with these images. There it is. Just well, it. we have a version that doesn't have it, and that's what Martin was wanting to ask. But I'm always worried that what what ends up happening is YouTube interrupts our show. They'll stop our our stream. No, but that, but uh, first of all, it makes no sense whatsoever. People are uploading the trailer. All the time. The I know. The film is there in its entirety. MGM owns the copyright. They, they're not going to bug guys like you, you know? And these jerks at Screen Factory are full of shit. Because that's no, who it is. Screen Factory have, is the one who. They have doing no it. rights to the film. And, and uh, so uh, they have no rights. They had a very, a very limited. A very limited window, uh, uh, and the rights were relegated to releasing the uh, Blu-ray version of the film. As a matter of fact, uh, those uh, SOBs, aside from the fact that they didn't live up to their word with me, um, oh, why not? no, yeah, they wanted to release, and they did release *Fear No Evil* on Blu-ray afterwards, and they came to me uh, after they screwed me. You know, and didn't live up to their word on Lady and White, and they wanted to use the uh, the. Uh, they said they were going to use the uh, commentary track that I recorded specifically and got, was paid to record, and specifically had made a deal with Anchor Bay on their original DVD release. Now period. I do like Anchor Bay. Yeah, um, they're pretty and fair I, the way they treat people. And I said, and they paid me for that significant amount of pay, money, and. My deal with them was that it was only to be used on that release of Fear No Evil. So these pricks were about to use it on their uh, screen, on their uh, 4K release of Fear No Evil. And I said, you do, and I'll sue your ass. And I told them, I said, they said, well, Bill Lustig, you know, told us he has the rights. He bought all the rights to the APCO. I said, I don't give a fuck what Bill Lustig. I think Bill Lustig is the guy who directed Maniac. Know what else he did? I said, I don't care. Well, I'm friends with the guys over um, at. Um, I just anyway, they name. didn't do it. They didn't do it. And then they wanted me. And they wanted, on top of that, they wanted me to record a commentary track, you know. And were offering me nothing. And I told them to go fuck themselves in that regard as well. 
the show, but they have no right to tell you what to do with any of these images. And, and uh, so I want to, you know, if I get a chance to, I want to introduce you to Don Mays, a friend of mine. He well, runs I know the, Don. I know you Don. know Don. As a matter uh, of fact, Don I and went, I used to I, live in <clears throat> Champaign, Illinois. Yeah, I went to Don. Because Don was with Elite, uh, Elite handled uh, with Vinny Bancalari originally. And Elite, Elite handled the laser disc uh, release of Lady in White way back in the day. And also, uh, I gave them, I controlled all of the rights at that point. And I, uh, I made a deal with them for the first DVD release. So I met Don of uh, Lady in White. I met Don back then. That was you should back. definitely talk to him the next no, time. No, but he wrote, I went to him first. And he attempted to write MGM, and uh, he did, and he followed up, and they never got back to him. That's why, you know, you never know what the truth is with these guys, number one. You don't know what their past relationships have been like, you know, who knows? Yeah. You know, what... what well, if they put, if uh, they rub somebody the wrong way, yeah, exactly. I, I totally get it, 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 yeah. There's no way of knowing that. But I tried to, went to Don first, and I said, let's... let's I wish you had stuck with him, because... I probably would have done the special art for it because if yeah, you didn't know never, this, never, I've done a lot of poster work for them. I followed up with him in, on any number of occasions <clears throat> and I never, he, he always got back to me and said, I haven't heard anything. I'll, I'll write to them again. And I believe that they never got back to him or maybe they did and told him they weren't interested. Uh, I think he would have told me if, uh, if they had gotten back to him, but uh why they didn't get back to him, I don't know. But they're obviously they're not they're not making a quick uh, uh, getting back of it to right. as regards vinegar syndrome either. Well, so, I've run know, into that myself uh, yeah. with some of these studios. Um, but I, here, I wanted to show you this. I don't know if you ever saw this. That's oh. the cover I did for Bruce Campbell's Running Time through oh. Synapse. Oh. oh, it was one of my oh. favorite posters I got to do. Nice, nice. And I worked personally with Don May on that one. Because he's like, can you do like the classic Thunderbolt and Lightfoot poster? Like, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And that's what I did. Yeah, that's nice. Yeah. So back to the film. So uh, this scene is so intense, by the way. This is where she shoots him. Yeah. And I always said this. I told people, I said, this is like a ghost story meets um, To Kill a Mockingbird. Yeah. Because there are the, the elements, and she watches her husband get shot right in front of her. And I'm like, that scene is just like, wow. It's an intense moment in the film. You know, the picture's got as much to do, the story's got as much to do with the era as it does. Oh, it does. What was going on during that time period. <clears throat> so, to me, it was an integral part of the story. Now, in the theatrical release of the picture, that part of the story was cut back by myself <clears throat> to some degree. Then, when the picture was released on uh, had its first DVD release uh, with Elite, I put back a number of scenes related to that aspect of the story. And, uh, and also, in the extended director's cut on the Blu-ray, there's a little bit more um, as relates to that part of the story. <clears throat> but we got a lot of criticism from, mostly from genre types, but some of the critics as well, as regards the uh, theatrical re release saying that it had nothing to do with the story and you know felt tacked on. And, and I've asked myself over the years, maybe that's because of the theatrical release what I did myself, because the distributor felt the, the film was long. And even though my deal with them stated they couldn't touch it unless I approved or I made any changes personally, <clears throat> I didn't want to rub them the wrong way because we also had a deal whereby they needed to spend a million dollars to open the picture minimally, theatrically. And if they hadn't spent that money, my deal with uh, the video distributor wouldn't have kicked in because the video distributor, Virgin Vision said, we'll give you $2 million if 
you find a theatrical distributor in the U.S. that spends at least a million on the theatrical release. So I got New Century Vista to commit to that. And when they began to express some concern, they wanted the film to be a little tighter. I went back and I made some changes. They don't want to risk they weren't they're not spending that million. That would have meant I lose three million. You know. Right. So now I lose two million, not three million, two million for, uh, at that point because uh, Goldwyn, I was okay with them with the million advance and the seventy uh, percent of foreign that we would participate in. So I made those changes. Um, now, after the Blu-ray release, and I managed to put together the extended director's cut, I must say that that's my preferred cut. Prior was the director's cut. I have to admit, I, I like it too, because it feels like a more complete story. Yeah, it's definitely my... And we were talking about Sidney Lassick, and we kind of got off the subject. And what I was going to say is that Sidney... He's had, a wonderful actor. Yeah, he had a key scene in the film, and poor Sidney... It was cut out of, I, I made the decision, we cut it out uh, for the theatrical release. And then on the, uh, on the original DVD release, I held back, I didn't put it back in, but I did put it back in for the extended director's cut. And so he's finally back in the picture. And it's a beautiful scene. It's about a four and a half minute long scene at Frankie's Thinking Tree. And he was marvelous, he was just, he was as, as you'd expect him to be because Sidney brought so much of himself to his roles. That's who he was. You know, he, uh, he was very, he was an intelligent man, but just a wonderful little oddball, you know, that you wanted to embrace, who embraced life. He had a great appreciation for art. Uh, and I, I understand that he kept a, nine to five job throughout his entire life uh he's like a dispatcher for some trucking company. somebody have to it sucks because yeah. they yeah. can't make a living off of it yeah but what a what a wonderful guy and uh sadly he passed away before that happened before i managed to put that scene back in for the extended director's cut but i always felt badly about that uh but he was terrific and he's back now, so everybody can see it in his work. Yeah, yeah. and this ending is pretty trippy because um, the the scene I like here is when he turns in and he sees uh, Alex Rocco's face, you know, and the shame, yeah, comes over him. But that's the other thing because I've had a bit of criticism as to uh, that last gotcha comeback moment when you think Phil has gone over the cliff and then he grabs right here. Is that it? No, that's not it. No, it's coming up. When, when he grabs strike, he's like, but I had to bring him back because he needed to confront Angelo. So, and that's the way I chose to do it. I'm very comfortable with it. You got it. And you I'm curious, a version, was, you was there a without these horrible disclaimers on these double images you should definitely use it and because this is i may do a cut i may do a cut of this this, this video that has the you regular really, so people can see that, it. that that does no good you know it makes you look it doesn't make you look good either you know you should really they youtube forces yeah. us to do this it's no, youtube no. really more than anybody i have every one of these images and more screen captures on my website they don't care and absolutely they don't I care. Have they, them. I have uh, all the trailers. There are clips from the film that are all over you. That's bullshit. Uh, never let these guys, never let any of these guys. You're too small. You have to understand something. You're too yeah, we're small. Not all they do, they, they've got these fucking lawyers, you know, or legal, uh, they're not even lawyers, you know, they're like law clerk types, you know, that are there to harass people. They're not gonna. They're not gonna give you any trouble. You just tell them to fuck off. That's what you need to do. I do that. I've done that all my life, and I've never suffered for it. And I've had when I've threatened them, they always back down. They're, they're, well, the what version that we're gonna have on Rumble? I'll probably edit it and put the yeah, other version that to, has no copyright disclaimers. Or on it. 
you know, just get rid of these, unfortunately, you know, and and redo this if you can to expand the image. Oh, I can. I can yeah. do a, a different cut with this because and edit this, it. This, this makes you look terrible. It's, uh, I'm sorry, but if you do it, you're going to have to cut around my comments at this point. No, no, no. It's it's a visual edit. It's yeah. it, Nobody will notice it. Is uh, is Anima still there? Are are Martin and Anima still around? I just checked. Oh yes. Yeah, of ah, course. Yes. Yeah. They're mesmerized by your stories. They get you quiet. Made, you, you say it like a joke, but in my case, it's real. No, I'm not joking. Same. same. I know you guys are listening, and it's something funny that happens, Frank, because um, this will happen when I'm doing these shows um, where we have somebody like. Phil Morris is a friend of mine. You might remember him as the lawyer from Seinfeld that was meant to be, uh, to look like the OJ Simpson lawyer, you know, with the gloves and everything. Yeah. Um, if it don't fit, you must have quit. Uh, I forget his name, the big lawyer. But Phil Morris played the Seinfeld version of that. And um, it's so freaking funny uh, that I met him because um, we would do conventions. And I met him at a convention. And the first thing I did, because if you, there's something you figured out, I'm not afraid to talk to people. And I don't care about celebrity because I work in the industry. And I just, I'm not, I'm never starstruck ever. And the first time I met Phil Morris, a beautiful black man, just gorgeous. I sent two old white ladies over to his table to tell him how much they love him in TV and film. And then to start naming movies and films or movies and TV shows he's never been in that other black actors were in. <laughs> and it was, he's just sitting there and he just kept like, I I wasn't in that either. And it was really freaking him out. <laughs> and it was a prank. I played a prank on him the first time. I well, met you're him. a very likable fellow. That's why when he asked me to do this, I thought, oh, Jesus, not again. No. Okay. <laughs> I thought. For Gary, and thank God you changed the spelling, but it's, it now looks funny, double R. I think for cried out loud. There are it those. irritates me. It irritates you, the shit out you, of me. You, 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 you can't now. win for losing when it comes to your name. I, I can't mean, win with my name. I can't. <laughs> but Anima, last time we did this, I really ribbed him hard about G-E-R-R-Y. He, he did. And he told me the whole. Geriatric, he right? He told me all about why. <laughs> You know, it's a correct pronunciation as regards his roots. It's the original you know, Gary. Blah, 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 blah. I didn't give a shit. You know, so I no, said, just, uh, you I, sat there and just shat all over. As far as I'm concerned, it's Gary. <laughs> now what's he do? He goes back. <laughs> and he changes. <laughs> and he spells it G-A. Not G-A-R-Y, but G-A-R-R-Y. So he's trying to hang on to his roots. Like, <laughs> like hang on the double R. And it just looks silly. It looks funny. I'm like, Gary Dowdy. It looks stupid. Look, we call him Geary, right? Geary. That's right. Geary. So now, he tries to call him Geary. Rib, you got a rib of about that. I'm like, why are you spelling <laughs> Gary G? G <laughs> why? So, you know. I'm, I'm yeah, the, and the new one, by the something. way. You know, exactly Frank, the new one. You know, you have is, a lot of influence over him. So. Yes, she does. Um but there, there's a new soul. one, Frank. There's it's a new a one. Beautiful soul, but you have to, you have to get him to understand. <laughs> <laughs> Jerry, G A R R Y ain't gonna cut it. The nope. new pronunciation by some people on the interwebs is Jagari. See, <laughs> and, and are you enjoying that? Are you enjoying no. that? Yeah, I, I got well, Ben. You're a glutton for punishment. You're doing it yourself. What is wrong with you? I don't, I don't get know. it. I don't get. I don't know, Frank. One of his favorite shows to guest on is Toxic Tuesday, and the host calls him Geary. Geary. Yep, that's that's Nick. Um, very popular that, yeah. show. He yeah. invites me on. Um, and by the way, it's it's probably one of the most homoerotic shows I've ever done is, is Toxic Tuesday because there's a lot we do a lot of gay comments to each other about well, I'd like to see you naked. <laughs> you probably it's enjoy that show, show, but it's so late. It's like 3 30 hour time. Yeah, it's late at night for her. She yeah. has to go to bed. Uh but anyway, Frank, I want to thank you. Uh it was so good. I love listening to you. I know everybody else does. You have great stories. 
Uh, the next time I bug you, it's going to be to do a, a cover of um, Fear No Evil. Because I've never done a cover of that. And I would like to cover that movie. And uh, yeah, you're, you're, it's nice if you haven't seen it. They did do a, a good job. I saw it back in the 80s. And no, I do I'm have not, it. I have I'm it on my heart. Oh, the Blu ray. Oh, Blu -ray. Blu -ray. Yeah, the Blu ray looks nice. And, uh, yeah, and that was put out by them. Uh, who put that out? I was Screen Factory. Screen Factory. Yeah. I buy a lot of their movies. They, they put out a copy of The Exorcist 3 that I bought. I loved it. Uh, I'm a big fan of that film, too. Did you see that movie? Yeah, I, I, you know, I know there are a lot of people that love it, but I just think it's a disjointed mess. Right now. Well, I prefer the book, to be honest with you, over the no, movie. I've never read it. William read. Peter Blatty wrote it, and yeah, the book is better than the movie because it goes into what he's really talking um, about. You know, and he directed that as well. He directed Lee. But he, he complained that the studio forced him to do things that he didn't want to do. Well, I, I I don't I have no reason uh, not to believe him, but he did write and direct a film that <clears throat> also <clears throat> has its problems, but it doesn't really matter to me because it's so heartfelt and uh, so compelling, and that's the last configuration, the ninth configuration. Or, uh, Shut up, Shinotsky. Yeah. <laughs> seen Gary naked or, uh, and all right is, um, uh, yeah it's killer killer twinkle cane yep we do uh, have a backdoor breach so I'm gonna play a little video for them uh that was from parrot head do my uh, favorite do my favorite share this share the the comment martin the name. so if you haven't started one. oh right um, sorry Jesus Christ you're such a boomer martin now. there you go we have a backdoor joke that goes with this show. Wow. So we make videos, and so here is our backdoor video for that one, Parrothead. Open your back door, baby. Loosen your hinges, I'll show you my key. <laughs> <laughs> it is so perverse. This show is just ridiculous. I think this show's gotten better I because we just... react to that. All I can say is, good night. <laughs> It's been, it's been lovely uh, uh, spending the past six hours. Or it feels like <laughs> it's been two hours. <laughs> and, oh my uh, god! And don't call back soon. Don't call back. <laughs> All right, Frank, stick around for after the show so we can talk to you just for a couple of minutes before you go. But we're going to do our little outro here, guys. I want to thank everybody for showing up, and and uh, everybody have a great weekend and happy Halloween. See you tomorrow.